Good evening, everyone. Uh, thank you for being here. My name is Ramzi Barud. I'm a Palestinian uh, writer. Um, I'm very honored uh, to be uh, moderating this event uh, by two people that I'm proud to call my friend. Uh, they are friends of the Palestinian people as well, and they are a representation of a much uh, larger collective of civil society activists here in America, but all over the world, who as of late kind of changed or affected a paradigm shift of how things or, or the type of relationship that Palestinians have with the rest of the world. Um, we are going to try to, um, uh, I'm going to try to make it as short as possible to bring uh, uh, Greta and Bell over here. But before, I would like just to make uh, or to give a very brief background, at least from a Palestinian perspective, of why is this book important, why these individuals, the 44 of them who went to Gaza in August 2008, uh, 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 on the uh, two boats, the Liberty and the Free Gaza. Why are their efforts, or were their efforts very significant, and why did they usher a new discourse, one that couples words with action, and why that matters? Um, first, I would like to say that nothing can be um, as demoralizing for a nation, any nation, any oppressed nation, than to feel um, alone victimized, oppressed, cornered, subjugated year after year, not knowing whether the world out there cares at all. Um, for nearly six decades, that's the type of relationship that governed, or, uh, governed Palestinians uh, uh, and their relations to the rest of the international community. Neighbors who pay lip service and, and they don't do much uh, by way of coming to the aid of the Palestinians, uh, international law that exists on paper, but is never uh, um, enforced by any means. And, of course, the, those who define what the international community is or is not, the US government, uh, the EU, and various other supporters and backers of Israel. So, for many years, there was this kind of lack of understanding what is the international community. As writers, we always put it between quotes, what is it? Does it exist? Is it just U.S. government's powerful pro-Israel lobby in Washington, the New York Times and, and, and the intellectual cliques in, in, in D.C. and in London and Madrid and elsewhere? Or is there another component to that? Well, that component, in fact, did exist for a long time. Um, however, we needed that paradigm shift, that moment when the support and solidarity turns into action. And I would say it was the siege on Gaza following the democratic elections in January 2006 in Palestine that provided that trigger, 2007 in particular, and that's when civil society here in Seattle, as much as it was in hundreds of cities across the world, people grew, uh, ordinary people, just getting together in churches, mosques, synagogues, universities, um, everywhere else, and talking, what can we do? Are we going to just sit here and watch, or are we going to do something? Well, that involves the, uh, the Freedom Sailors. There were 44 of them, but of course the network it was much larger. The support that they have received involved all sectors of many societies all across the world. Um, and they decided that they wanted to do something about it, something revolutionary, something unique, and something different. It doesn't promise to change the world, but at least promises to bring a world of change. And two of those sailors are with us today. They are going to tell us their story. We are very honored uh, uh, to uh, have them with us this evening. And so please uh, help me welcome uh, Greta Berlin and uh, Dr. Bill uh, Dienest uh, to the stage. Thank you so much. Well, as the local boy, I'm going to start. I'm a graduate of the University of Washington School of Medicine, class of 1986. Uh, but in 1982, Israel invaded Lebanon, and all, me, all my lefty uh, medical students and I, there were concerned about El Salvador and Nicaragua. Well, nobody was saying anything about Israel's invading Lebanon and killing 15 to 30,000 people in a month. So I got involved then. I went to the Middle East for the first time in 85. I've been there six times since, including the Free Gaza Movement. 
Um, and I want you to, I want you to get to know somebody who's just a very special person, Greta Berlin. Um, but before we get to Greta, who's the main star of this show, I want to tell you a little bit about Gaza. This is Gaza. Gaza is the most densely populated place on the, ch on the planet. Perhaps Hong Kong, but people in Hong Kong can come and go. Gaza is 25 miles long. It averages five miles wide, 125 square miles, 1.7 million people. It is surrounded by a wall that is more hideous than the Berlin Wall on the Israeli border. They also had an iron wall with Egypt. It was blown up in 2008, but thanks to US taxpayers, we convinced the Egyptians to build a stone wall. So it is trapped by land. Overhead, F-16s, helicopter gunships, and drones patrol the air. And by sea, the Israeli Navy. And in fact, Gaza fishermen can only go out, depending on the temperament of the Israeli Navy, three to six nautical miles, even less sometimes people get shot at, people get killed, people get maimed, and fishermen are denied their livelihood. Farmers on the periphery are denied their livelihood. They risk life and death getting killed by snipers for trying to cultivate their crops in the most densely populated place on the planet. Now, there used to be Israeli settlers here. There were about 8,000 of them. In 2005, they were pulled out, and Ariel Sharon proclaimed that Gaza was free. Well, we in the Free Gaza Movement decided we would challenge that hypothesis because if Gaza's free, we should be able to just take a boat and sail right in there, don't you think? Hell, we'll open up a ferry service. Why not? This is what it looks like. This is, this is the population density. Uh, from, this is from al -Auda Hospital on the rooftop in Jabalia refugee camp. 100,000 people in a refugee camp. There's eight refugee camps. There's three major cities. There's all these towns just crammed in there. And you can see on the rooftops there's pilings for the next generation because there's nowhere to build horizontally. There's only room to build vertically. So what is the future of this? What is the future? I'd like to turn over this discussion for the moment to Greta. We're going to go back and forth tonight. This will be fun, I hope. Thank you. Does this work? No. You know, I'm the kind of individual that when the uh, light goes on in the refrigerator, I do five minutes to the fruit. Hi, fruit! <laughs> So I do hope to entertain you tonight and also to encourage you to get the book and to give you a little bit about how insane this idea really was. There are a couple of you I see in the audience who I have known since the very beginning of this. People who believed in us because believe me, very few people believed in us. My children thought we were crazy. My children are Palestinian. They thought it was nuts that we were even considering trying to sail a boat to Gaza. So how did we get, where did we get this idea? A man by the name of Michael Sheikh sent out an email to us in 2006. And it was when Israel was busy attacking Lebanon. And he said, you know, I have this idea. I think maybe we should buy a boat in New York. And then we can sail it to Europe, and we can go down the coast of Europe, and we can go through the Straits of Gibraltar, and we can stop, and we can talk about Palestine, and uh, then we can sail it to Gaza. <laughs> I was sitting in my friend's living room. Her name is Mary Hughes Thompson, and she's one of the founders of the Free Gaza Movement. And I looked at her, I will never forget. I looked at her and I went, oh my God, that's Brilliant. Now, you have to remember, we had no idea what a boat was. We had no idea what we were going to do. We had no idea, for example, that we couldn't rent a boat. That's the first thing we tried. But we'll go out and we'll rent a boat and go to, <laughs> go to Gaza. Well, of course, every time we were trying to rent a boat, they said, where are you taking our boat? And they would, we'd say, Gaza. They'd go, Ghana? No, Gaza. 
well, where's Gaza? Well, you know, it's that little tiny strip over here. No, I'm sorry, we're not renting a boat to you. So we realized that the only way we were ever going to do this was to raise money. You need to remember, there was no Twitter. There was no Facebook. It's amazing when you think only, what, six years ago, seven years ago, none of those things existed. We had Google, and we organized everything on Google. We didn't know, Mary and I knew the founders, there were three other founders that did this with us, but we didn't know anybody. We pretty much said, for everybody who wants to get involved in this and maybe wants to go, you have to have two recommendations. Most of the people, the initial people who went on the boat came out of the ISM, they came out of the International Solidarity Movement, uh, oftentimes they came out of the um, Christian peacekeepers. We had an 81-year-old nun, for example, who was on board. That's where we got everybody. I think what was unique about this particular trip is that we really were just plain, ordinary people. Nobody was famous. I suppose the most famous person was Lauren Booth. You all know who she is? Oh, good, you do. <laughs> we didn't. When, when they said Lauren Booth was going to show up, I went, God, is, is, is she related to John Wilkes? <laughs> Booth? I had no idea who she was. And she was a trooper. She was marvelous. But she was probably the only one, she and Jeff Helper, with a, um, Israeli, um, what is it? House demolition. Um, they were really the only two. Everybody else were activists. Many of us had been kicked out of the West Bank. Many of us were not allowed to go back. Please explain who was Lauren Booth. Lauren Booth was Tony Blair's sister-in-law. So it was very appropriate. Thank you. So it was very appropriate. Of course, what she didn't tell us is that he hadn't spoken to her in years. But, you know, it looked good, and we were trying to put uh, Blair on the spot. When we decided that this is what we were going to do, and we were actually going to sail, we decided we could do that because Israel said that Gaza was free. That's what they said. Do you remember? All the settlers are going to be taken out. Gaza is now free. So we didn't have to ask permission. We were just going to go sail straight from Cyprus, which is where we ultimately sailed from, and into Gaza without asking anybody for permission. And that's what we decided to do. So we organized ourselves. We got very, very good. We were very good. I teach engineers, so I'm a really good organizer because they are very linear. So I had all of these lists, and I sent them all out. I mean, and you know that. I sent them all out to everybody. I, we gathered everybody. By the time we finished this, we had thousands of people, thousands of people who believed in us. And we started to collect money. Then we had to find a boat buyer. And we had a man that I had known for years from Austin, Texas. His name was Riyad Hamad. Any of you know and who he was? I know some of you do. He was an amazing, amazing Lebanese activist. He, he said to me, my father ran a Coca-Cola business. I know where to buy you a boat. So if you will spend all of 2007, and so will I, I will go and buy you a boat. He had one problem, and that is he was a thorn in the side of Bush and Ashcroft and everybody else. I'm going to let Bill read just a small part of what he wrote. Riyadh was a bit of an uppity Arab. And after 9-11, um, after of course, people were under fire. People were being imprisoned without due process. People were afraid, not Riyadh. Let me read a note that he sent to uh, Attorney General John Ashcroft regarding my children, monitoring of my friends, family, intrusion in my privacy and civil rights. My neighbor came up to me a few day, uh, weeks ago and informed me that an agent of the Federal Bureau of Investigation called him again regarding some information about my activities and other personal matters. Mr. Frank R. specifically told me that the agent inquired about the kind of car that I drive since your agents cannot find any records of car ownership for me in Travis County in the state of Texas. That's Austin, by the way. 
Your agent should know the car that I drive, since it has more than 20 bumper stickers in support of the people of Palestine, against the occupation of Palestine, against the war in Iraq, and one that states, quote, a village in Texas is missing its idiot, unquote. And I, <laughs> and I think that he now lives on 1600 Pennsylvania Avenue in Washington, D.C. If you cannot identify the car, and for your convenience, I have written, I am an Arab, Ana Arabi, in large characters in English and in Arabic on the rear window that even a visually impaired person can see, unless they are blind in the mind and the heart like you and the rest of the administration that you represent. <laughs> uppity, 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 he was asking oh, he for was trouble. He was so wonderful. He also wrote, and he said, I only own three shirts, so if you want to come after me, you're not going to get very much. I have a blue shirt for dress. I have a puce green shirt when I'm feeling hostile. And I have a pink shirt right there when I want to get in touch with my feminine self because I know you hate gays. <laughs> so we spent a year, all of us, collecting money. And we had collected about $75,000. It took a year because nobody knew who we were. We were sending out pleas. We had set up a PayPal account. Finally, Riyadh in uh, February said, there's enough money for me to go buy the boat. I have the boat, but I don't want to tell you where it is. So send me $25,000 and I will match it with my $25,000. So Paula Rudy and I wired him $25,000 and the next day the IRS and the FBI came after him. They knocked on his door. They said that he w had to come and answer some questions and oh by the way, so did his children. Riyadh didn't care what they did to him, he was remarkable. But when they went after his daughter in medical school and they went after his son in college, he was in absolute despair. He didn't think that they had the right to talk to his children. But they had taken everything, including our money. By the way, we never got our money back, oh. ever. But they had taken all of the money, they had taken all of the paperwork for free Gaza, they had taken everything. And he became, became increasingly depressed, he was getting more and more depressed and more and more frantic because he was worried about his children. On April 14th, 2008, he committed suicide. Now, a lot of people said that the government killed him. Yes, actually, the government killed him. They just didn't pull the trigger. But they drove Riyadh into despair. And he thought the only way he was going to get out of it and save his children was to commit suicide, which he did. Ironically, of course, the government dropped everything against his children. For me, who had known him for years and years, I was devastated. I had lost a friend. I had lost one of the craziest people I'd ever met. I had lost somebody who believed in Palestine and wasn't, he wasn't Palestinian, he was Lebanese. I'll tell you one quick story and then we'll go on to the rest. He got a letter from a little boy in Khan Yunis. And it was one of the times that Israel was bombing at random in Gaza. And the little boy said, my house is gone. I have nothing and it's okay, we'll be all right. But I lost my red bicycle. And if you can do anything about it, is it possible that you could send me a red bicycle? Now remember, Riyadh's in Austin, and the little boy's in Gaza. And 48 hours later, there was a red bicycle at the little boy's tent. That was Riyadh. I don't even know how he got it in there. But we lost an amazing man. And by the way, we had told everybody by then we were going to go in May of 2008 is a commemoration on the Nakba Day. We had no money. We had lost our best friend. We had no boat buyers. We had no idea where the boat was. And we now had 88, by the way, we started out with 88 passengers. We had 88 passengers who were trying to figure out how they were all going to get to Cyprus because that's how, where we were, we were going to leave from. Mary, one of the co-founders, put out a plea. Many of you got that plea. And she said, this is what has happened. In Riyadh's memory, 
please donate. We cannot get a boat to Gaza unless you donate. We got $75,000 in 72 hours. Those little miracles that came from people who are just average people. People were sending us their social security checks. The US, list, you know the USS Liberty? You know the story, all of you, about the USS Liberty, how it was bombed during the Six Day War? They were sending us their pension checks. We got $1.50 from Burma just because they wanted to be part of this. After this all happened, we finally got enough money to buy a boat, and we had no idea who to contact. And I had a Greek friend of mine, and she said, oh, don't worry about it. I'll find the Greeks for you. And of course, I thought, of course she would. Poseidon, Greek islands, surely they must know how to find a boat. And that's what we ended up doing. We found all of the old Greek communists. I am not kidding you. <laughs> Their average age was 70. But they were, OK, they were 60. <laughs> but they said, yes, we'll find you a boat. Yes, you, you can meet your deadline. Maybe we'll all go in July instead. Now, they had between May and July to find a boat and to get it ready. You want to read the piece of it? Uh, sure. In fact, what they had to do was find two boats, and they found two ramshackle fishing boats, and they had to pull them into dry dock because they'd been sitting mothballed for years, and they pulled them ashore, and they did all this clandestinely. Now, these people that overthrew, that were part of the overthrow of the Greek fascist dictatorship in 1974, had experience in clandestine operations. The organizer was, uh, was Vangelis Pisius, right above Paul Arruti, right here. And our author for this segment is Petros Giotis. Let me read Petros. I'll try to do it with a Greek accent. <laughs> the Free Gaza Movement asks us Greeks to provide mission support prepare a boat that could reach Gaza but could prevent the Zionist spies from learning the project and trying to sabotage our efforts. Until that time, previous attempts to purchase free Gaza movement boats had failed. The Zionists had been able to gain access to the boats on sale and managed to cancel their purchase. On the other hand, even if a boat could be purchased for free Gaza, it was always at risk for being found and sunk by the Zionists. This means that an absolutely legal action, as it is not illegal under international law to sail to Gaza, has to be accomplished in secret as if it were illegal. So, for everyone's safety and for the success of the mission, we needed to conduct all of our op operations in the strictest secrecy every step of the way until and including mooring of the two boats clandestinely in separate harbors around Athens. The whereabouts of one boat and crew would not be known to the other boat and crew. Each of us involved in the project would function on a need-to-know basis, keeping the overall details as quiet as possible. I didn't have it to give it a lot of thought. I would join the mission at once. <laughs> and he did. And we, of course, all the rest of us who are internationals, when we say there were 44 people that we finally left, they, we were from 17 countries. So, I mean, it was almost uh, um, insane because not only are we trying to do this, but we don't understand each other. It's not that everybody spoke English. It's just that nobody spoke English in the same way. And so we Americans, who tend to be very blunt and want to get things done on time, couldn't understand why Greek mean time meant three days from then. And we, by the time we finally sailed, nobody was speaking to anybody, by the way. It took being out on the sea and, being, uh, and having all of our communications cut off and having everybody sick when we si finally realized that it was probably a lot better to stick together instead of worrying about who didn't make the deadline. They found us two fishing boats. They were, we thought they were beautiful. And you can see them on the front page of the book, of course, and you saw them up here. They were the most ramshackle, pathetic-looking wooden boats 
that we thought were magnificent. One had a, a, a sail, what do you call those? Pole. Thank you, mast. You can tell I still don't know anything about boats. Mast. One had a mast, but it didn't work. The other one had no bunks underneath. That's because that's where they stored all the fish. Both boats reeked of fish. But we thought they were beautiful. And there was nothing on the boats. There wasn't even a steering wheel on the free Gaza. So they install the steering wheel. They're ready to come. Bill is in uh, Greece. I'm trying to keep all the passengers who are not either overtly hostile, because we are now a month late, or are restless. I'm trying to keep them occupied. And they said, OK, the boat is ready to go. They launch the boat. They turn the boat right, and the boat goes left. They pushed, the, they pushed the wheel forward, and the boat went backwards and ended up on a sandbar because it was installed backwards. So of course, we lost two days because we had to wait for the tide to come in so that the free Gaza would be released and would be able to go. Let me tell you about these boats, and let me tell you about Greece. Who's been to Greece? You know what's really cool about Greece? Well, first let's talk about 1988, the PLO ship of return. In 1988, they wanted to outfit a boat with Palestinian refugees, clerics, and elderly statesmen, a la Exodus, and sail it into Haifa Harbor in Palestine, Israel. What happened was the boat was sabotaged. Israeli frogmen blew up the engine, and the next day, the three organizers were killed in a car bomb. So that's what we had to go with. So that's why we had to hide. But what's cool about Greece is it has lots of islands, and it has lots of harbors, and it has lots of boats. Uh, and you know, um, is the next slide uh, the, the boat? Let's see. Yeah, OK. So this is the Liberty, but um, in uh, the harbor where it was hidden is the Agios Nikolaos. Agios Nikolaos means St. Nicholas in Greek. Now, there are lots of little villages in Greece named St. Nicholas, and there's lots of little boats named St. Nicholas and maybe counties. And so Agios Nikolaos was the name of one boat, and the other boat was Dimitrios Kappa. So I was dispatched to Greece, and I finally, at the end of my 12 days there, got to see the liberty that was hidden in this harbor called Eritrea. So we pretend that we are a crew of marine biologists about to embark on a research excursion. We are warned by Evangelis not to talk about our real mission, even among ourselves, as others can hear us, and some of the villagers can understand English. For Gaza, we say Mykonos, a Greek island and tourist destination. We try our best, but several times we slip up and periodically mention the G word. During the next few days, it will become my one of my jobs to mediate conflicts between the people working and traveling on the boats. Without taking sides, let me state the obvious. A mission such as Free Gaza Movement attracts folks who are hard-headed, independent-minded, stubborn, and ingenious individuals. Do you know anybody like that? There's nobody in this room like that, I'm sure. With these attributes comes an ego. We all tend to be opinionated and to no one's surprise, sometimes see the world differently. It's a very interesting social experiment we have created. You put different kinds of people, united by a human rights cause, on a couple of boats together and add a bunch of logistical hurdles, delays, different cultures, different nationalities, different languages and customs, and then add deadlines and fear and paranoia and stress. There's bound to be conflict. The patterns are almost predictable. I really got a firm understanding of where the term ship of fools came from. <laughs> and it was several of our jobs to try to keep this whole thing from degenerating into a ship of fools. Now, did I tell you the subtitle of this book is How We Succeeded in Spite of Ourselves? It's true. <laughs> in the meantime, I'm in Cyprus trying to keep everybody occupied. Because we were supposed to leave the 30th of July. And we don't even know where the boats are. We have no idea. Remember, we eventually left on the 22nd of August. So we're trying to keep people interested. Interestingly enough, only four people left. They all waited in Cyprus. They all waited for the boats to come. They, w people were living on their credit cards. I still haven't paid my credit card off, by the way, for the uh, expenses in 2008. Because we were trying to raise money. We were trying to get 
the supplies. We were staying at the university. And so we would try to do something every single day. We would talk about um, the mission. We would talk about Gaza. And one day we decided that we had everybody would write a will. Which, in retrospect, by the way, was very wise because when the Israelis murdered the nine passengers on board the Mavi Marmara, two of those people did not write a will and they, their parents didn't know where they were. So we had written a will. One was to go back to somebody in the country where we were and the other one was going to be held by a man by the name of Ramzi Kaisia, who was our land crew. So everybody has done that. Everybody is talking about it. It took us a whole two days to figure out what we wanted to do. And then we said, all right, now, supposing you die on board, what do you want done with your body? Well, of course, all of us said, just throw us overboard. <laughs> Except Mushir Al-Farah. He was the Palestinian who was on board the Free Gaza. He decided that he was going to be buried in Gaza no matter what. Now, Mushir is about the same size the bill is. So what Mushir said is, just put me in the refrigerator and tape me to Gaza. The problem was is that the only refrigerators on those boats were those little teeny tiny refrigerators, you know, that you can put under a counter somewhere. And they were only cold enough to make one Coke cold. And he was determined. He said, I don't care. Put me in there anyhow. I'll never know. Just put me in there, send me to Gaza. Fortunately, we didn't have to do that. We finally realized that the boats were coming when Bill came back and said, yes, there's actually boats. By the way, for after a while, we thought that maybe there weren't any boats. So I was sending out press releases because I was doing all the press. And I don't know if any of you remember, but I would send out a press release and post it and say, the boats are ready to leave Alexandria. Egypt. Egypt. So the port authorities in Alexandria, Egypt would call the port authorities in Cyprus because they knew, and they would say, you know, we've got some Israelis down here. They're looking for these boats. Do you know anything about it? Well, fortunately for us, the Cypriots were on our side at that particular time, and they said they didn't know anything. So then maybe four days later, I'd put out another press release and say, the boats are now in Turkey. And so they'd send a crew to Turkey to find out where the boats were. I was having a lovely time doing this. And in retrospect, it was probably very wise because we were actually coming out of Greece. The other thing is we never changed the names on the boats. They were busy looking for the free Gaza and the Liberty. And as Bill said, they didn't exist. So we were able to slip out of Greece. They were able to come. They managed, it took forever for them to come to Cyprus. We finally got everybody to Cyprus. And I think on the 21st of August, all of the Cypriot people, I think there were 30 of us, were now going to meet the 14 people that were on board the boats. Those boats came around the corner of Cyprus. And we thought they were the most beautiful boats we had ever seen. We didn't even look at the peeling paint and the fact that there was no place to put any storage. We were only taking hearing aids. We paid no attention. We had lots and lots of water. That was one thing that we did. Had a press conference, and on the morning of the 22nd, we're leaving. We're all going. So off goes the free Gaza. Now, those boats were only qualified to carry 11 people each, including crew. We had 26 on the Free Gaza, and I think we had 19 on the Liberty, something like that. And the Cypriots allowed that to happen, because you have to remember that C Cyprus was then an EU country. So to leave the EU and go to Gaza, you had to get your passport stamped. So they knew that we were putting twice the number, in case of Free Gaza, three times the number, on board these crazy boats. It's a good thing nothing happened to us because they just turned a blind eye and just signed everything off and just let us go. Off we go already, and the Liberty breaks a fan belt. We only have one engine in each boat. So we had to wait and wait and wait until they fixed the fan belt. We took off. We're all excited. We are being escorted out of Cyprus, 
and we're on our way. The problem that happened to us is it was one of the very few times that the Mediterranean had a mistral. Do you know what a mistral is? It's one of those big windstorms that comes in from Morocco and stirs up the Mediterranean. Well, how many of you in here think the Mediterranean is nice and calm? <laughs> Wrong. It's only nice and calm in Greece. We're out in the middle of nowhere. The boats are getting slapped back and forth. We're on the, I'm on the one that's got the mast on it, so the mast is going like this, and it's coming back up, and it's going over that way. And of course, everybody is sick. My dearest friend Mary, who has been with me for the entire time through this, sits in the Zodiac. The Zodiac is the little rubber boat that all boats have. I don't know what good they are, because you could only put two people in them, but it somehow made us feel better. She's in the Zodiac, and she's throwing up in rubber gloves. But she's very neat. She's British, after all, so she's very neat. So she fills every one of the fingers <laughs> on the glove and the thumb, and then she ties it off at the top and hands it to me and says, throw it overboard. I was, after the first um, hour, I was no longer sick, so I try to stumble back to the back, and I'm throwing these rubber gloves off like, you know, Hansel and Gretel. And if anybody wants to come look for us, just look for the vomity gloves. And if we got lost, we could like trace our way back. Uh, oh, all, yeah, we trace our way all the back. And the nurse on board had said, we have to get biodegradable rubber gloves. And we said, well, oh, we don't need that. It was the best thing we did. Because whatever was going to eat those things was not going to die. Um, at about, I would say, when the, when the sun went down, um, Israel cut off all of our communications. Everything was gone. Our um, channel 16, which is the um, st channel in case you get into trouble, our, our, our GPS was gone, our satellite phones were gone, everything was gone. And it was gone all night. We were cut off from the world, and the world didn't know where we were, and the world thought maybe we had been sunk. What, did, what was the what were they saying over the airwaves? Uh, they are lost. We, we could hear the Israelis saying, they are lost, they are lost, they are lost. They, have, they, they are gone. So they were running uh, tapes for us on the channel to, I guess, intimidate us. We never saw anybody. We, the two boats were being run on um, paper and compass. And the only thing we had were walkie-talkies. And so we could talk back and forth to each other on the boats, and that was it. And everybody was sick. Pretty much everybody on board those boats were, were sick. Some so sick that we thought maybe we were going to have to um, get a helicopter. We, I kept thinking, oh my god, we've been working on this for two and a half, three years. And if we have to call the Israelis and tell them to rescue us, <laughs> I'd rather drown. I was barfing all over the stern. It was, I wasn't as tidy as Mary was. You no, know, no, Bill, Bill, the doctor, Dr. Bill was barfing. Um, almost everybody, I'd have to say almost everybody was. When the sun came up, we realized that we were probably about 30 miles off the coast. Remember, between Cyprus and Gaza, it's about 250 nautical miles. Which doesn't sound like very much. Some of you probably drove 250 miles. I mean, you don't think about it unless you're in a boat being hit by waves, wondering who the hell is going to kill you. And our boats only traveled seven nautical miles per hour. So this took forever, 33 hours of stomach churning, amusement park ride excitement. Just imagine, keep your eyes on the horizon, watch it rock to and fro, and take lots of naps, and just pretend you're on an amusement park and trying to have a good time. And of course, a lot of, a lot of times they said, well, go down below, because then you won't see, you know, close your eyes, go down below and rest. The trouble was it, that down below reeked of fish, so <laughs> you gasoline. didn't want to go down below. I mean, it's the last place that you wanted to go. When the sun came up, we realized that there were no Israeli ships anywhere. We, we didn't know where they were. So one, one Al Jazeera guy on board had never turned on his satellite phone. I don't know how we had enough sense to know that we should have kept one off, because we didn't know squat, nothing. 
But we, we said, oh gosh, maybe we should keep one off. So we, on the free Gaza, we said, turn on the phone, call your office in Gaza, tell them we're safe. And he got it. And Al Jazeera scrolled on the bottom. Ramsey, did you ever see the scroll on the bottom of Al Jazeera where it said they are safe, they are safe, they are safe, they are safe? I want to wrap this up by telling you that when we arrived in Gaza, we had 40,000 people. As we came in, that's a little bunch of kids on a fishing boat. They had 40,000 people waiting for us. Israel decided that they would not attack us after all, <laughs> as though somehow we had to ask for permission for them to attack us. I think they thought we were a bunch of old hippies, and so if they let us go, we would go away. <laughs> oh, they were just so wrong. But I think that's why they did it. I, it was one of the most glorious days, both of us will say that, of our, our lives. In fact, when I told my son about this, he said, well, Mom, wasn't that when you had me? I said, no. <laughs> I want to read the last thing. But before you do, let me tell you, this is really too cool. There was 40,000 people on the shore. It was the first time any boats had entered Gaza waters in 41 years since Israel occupied in 1967. And not only were there 40,000 on the shore, we were throwing balloons out in the water. The kids were f jumping in the water, and they were swimming up to the boats, and they were climbing aboard, and dignitaries were climbing aboard, and the boat was getting overloaded with too many people, and we were 200 yards from docking, and we thought we were going to sink right after, three, after 200 and whatever nautical miles. We thought we were going to sink 200 yards for the shore, but then the Hamas police detail restored order, and it was glorious pandemonium, glorious, glorious pandemonium. It was probably one of the most remarkable days, and certainly in my life, and that you would probably that would probably be true for all 44 passengers that went. Um, I, I want to end this because I, I want you to remember that this is not about the insane internationals that came in on a boat to Gaza. This was about keeping Gaza on the map and making sure that Gaza was not forgotten. So we had one man on. His name is Mushir El Fara. And he's from Gaza. And I want to leave this with what he wrote, because this is the reason that we went, and this was the reason that we continued to go. Mosher was born in Khan Yunus in the Gaza Strip. His family still lives there. He has um, Dr. Mona Farrar as his sister, and another, her, his other sister also is a prominent pediatrician. What he wrote was this. As Gaza started to appear on the horizon, I felt ecstatic. I just could not believe it. I never expected it. After all the threats, I thought we'd end up in an Israeli prison. I could not stop crying. At last, I will be able to visit my mother Layla's grave. Layla had always said to the people around her, even when she was in good health, if I die, please tell Mashir that the last words on my lips were his name. Yet I couldn't be at her bedside when she was dying at the hospital where I was born. I couldn't get in. I couldn't go back. I couldn't go back because of the inhuman and illegitimate siege. And my tears continued. I was actually seeing my homeland. I was coming in by sea. The morning that the, that the boats were ready to leave, I went with my colleague to my mother's grave. I woke up early and went. It was the first time I had visited the grave. We had been so busy for the few days that we were there. I spontaneously found myself talking to my mother. Mom, I'm here. I am visiting you despite this siege. I used to joke with my mother, do not die when I cannot be with you. And she would laugh and say, don't worry, I will not. If you promise to place me in the grave with your own hands, I promise to stay alive. But she was unable to. It was a great feeling, a feeling of freedom I had never experienced. It was the first time in my life that I had come home without the humiliation of being questioned or interrogated by the Israelis, without being threatened, without having my papers thrown around, 
without being told that I might not ever come back. I could not believe that feeling and that sense of freedom. And this is what I hope for all Palestinians. What Ramsey asked me is to give him uh, some background on Vittorio Aragani. How many of you know who he is? Do, do, some of you do. He was the most amazing Italian. He really was. He was the most amazing man. And he, he was on the free Gaza. And I, I'll tell you a little story about him. He was beautiful. He had tattoos all over him. And he had these wonderful muscles. And every afternoon, he would go to the front of the boat, and he would dump water over his head. We got one pail of water every day. And all of the women on the Free Gaza lined up in the back next to the wheelhouse to watch Vittorio take his shirt off. So <laughs> he was definitely our entertainment. He was truly a beautiful man, not, not only the way he looked, but also the way he really was. And he had been in Gaza off and on for just years and years. Uh, and he had come back with us on the Free Gaza, and then he stayed. He stayed with the International Solidarity Movement. He did a lot of work with the um, fishermen. He also did a lot of reporting for an Italian newspaper. And he would end everything, everything he wrote, he would end it by saying, stay human. And if you don't know who he is, you might have seen that. We made, we made shirts at one time that said, stay human. Um, he was murdered in Gaza. In, it's been about two years ago. April, April 2011. April 2011. Um, his mother said that that would be what he would have preferred, what he would have wished, but he was in his early 40s. And he was one of the very few people I've ever met that was full of joy. He would make you laugh, he would make you smile. We didn't, half the time I didn't understand a word he said. But it didn't make any difference. He was just a big and amazing man who believed in freedom for the Palestinians. And he gave his life for that. He did survive Operation Cast Lead, where he was there uh, during that onslaught. And he wrote a book in Italian and in English, Gaza Stay Human. And so if, that, if you want to hear his direct accounts of what happened from the, on the ground in Cast Lead, please look up that book, Gaza Stay Human. Um, they, the Hamas did arrest, I think they killed two people, and I think they arrested, I think, another two. And they were from some splinter group that nobody had ever heard of. And uh, one of the people that killed himself was a Jordanian who came through the tunnels, who, of course, you know, the Middle East is rife with, with rumors on top of rumors, but I think this was probably correct. They said he worked for Jordanian intelligence. Uh, Vittorio Aragani was a thorn in the side of Berlusconi, who was then the head of Italy. Whatever happened, whatever happened behind the scenes, I think that Vittorio was um, a sacrificial lamb. Uh, I think that also whoever designed this thought that if that happened to Vittorio, who was so high profile, nobody would come. It's like Rachel Corey. If you kill her, no one will come. Most of us came to work with the ISM because of Rachel Corey. It's, it's a stupid idea to think that if you kill one or two people, you're going to threaten people like us, who are hard-headed and stubborn and stupid <laughs> sometimes. It's just going to do exactly the opposite. Well, the question basically um, goes back to the, um, you know, whether the, uh, uh, the dog wags the tail or the tail wags the dog. Is Israel, uh, in fact, the, uh, at the core of all that is happening, is Israel determining the, the, the uh, political discourse uh, and its behavior in the Middle East, or is it a conduit? Is it a tool for uh, international global capitalism? And Israel more or less is kind of caught in this struggle uh, uh, that uh, has been imposed in the Middle East by capitalism. So 
Um, what, what is it? Well, you know, I was just going to say what you just said. Is it, is it the Western dog wagging the Israeli tail, or is it the Israeli tail wagging the Western dog? Well, there's all different kinds of interests to promote war. Eisenhower talked about the military-industrial complex. That's part of it. We hear about the neocons. We certainly hear about the Israeli lobby. So there's different shades. But there is an alliance between people who profit from war, who profit from imperialism, who profit from the domination of Western powers over native people in the Middle East. So uh, I think the answer is all of the above. OK, so basically there are uh, two questions here. One is, uh, what happened after the Liberty and the Free Gaza uh, sailed to Gaza in August 2008? Uh, that was not uh, obviously the end, that was the beginning of a whole shift in civil society strategy in Gaza. What happened after that and how do you view it? And the second question is regarding Huwaid Arraf, a Palestinian activist and the co-founder of the ISM. Uh, and how did she uh, uh, contribute to all this? I'm probably the person to answer both of those because I was pretty much involved in every, in every voyage except for one. Uh, there's actually been 12 voyages total by now. Maybe 13, it depends on how you want to count them. Uh, certainly, uh, Free Gaza ran the first five voyages, and all five of those voyages got in. All five did. And that's what people don't realize. You kind of know about the first one, and then you know about the one where the Mavi Marmara, where the, everybody was murdered. But we got in five times. What happened when we came back after that first trip is that the Palestinians stepped up. Rightfully so, they were pretty cynical about these crazy people who were crazy enough to get on a boat. Uh, I think Ramsey believed in us, maybe three or four other Palestinians did. We had two Palestinians on board. But most of the times they went, yeah, well, OK, prove it. When we got back after that first trip, a group of Palestinians in London bought us that boat called the Dignity. It was a yacht. And I remember going to look for a boat and a couple of our founders going, saying to me, you know, I, well, I just don't think we can buy a yacht. I, I really, I just don't think we can buy a yacht. I mean, we made a symbolic gesture with these two decrepit boats and you know, we, we're just activists. We can't buy a 250,000 euro yacht. And Mustafa Barghouti, you all know who he is was standing with us at that time, and he said, why not? Why can't the people of Gaza have a yacht come and visit them? Why don't they have the right to open their port? And that's what we did. We started taking in members of parliament in Europe. We started taking in high-profile people. Um, it was no longer, ironically, it was no longer a, um, an initiative that was done by just common people. Because we had made three promises to the Palestinians when we left. One is that we would take Palestinians out. And we took 28 total out of those trips. Two was that we would publicize it around the world as much as we could. And three was that we would return. And we did all of that. But we also knew that in order to stay protected, the higher profile that we got, the better off it was. We had people like Mairead McGuire, for example, who's a Nobel Peace Prize winner. Uh, she was on board. And so that worked very successfully until cast lead, when our boat, uh, Cynthia McKinney, was on that boat, when that boat was rammed. I, I do, by the way, love to hear the Israeli point of view, because they said we rammed them three times, sideways. <laughs> so we backed it up, and we ran into them three times that way. Yeah, that's impossible. Um, as a result, we decided to put a flotilla together because we thought one boat is not going to do it. That's why the, the first Freedom Flotilla was put together that was completely organized by Free Gaza. And the contacts that we had, Fatih Jawadi, who is a Tunisian, is the one who knew Ihaha, I-H-H, from Turkey. He was the one that pulled the uh, Turks in with the Mavi Marmara. The Turks, by the way, did not own that boat. It was owned by the Comoros Cormor Comoros Islands. Uh, so when they say it was a Turkish boat, it, it, it was, but it was flagged by the Comoros Islands. Uh, in, in part, they had thought that maybe if something happened, we would be able to take them to the criminal court because the Comoros Islands belongs to the International Criminal Court. I'm not sure that Turkey does. 
Does anybody know? Um, we, it hasn't gone anywhere. Uh, the, uh, the second question about Howeda. Um, Ho, uh, Ho, we, uh, the five co-founders who were Mary Hughes Thompson and uh, Renee Boyer and um, Paula Rudy and me and Sharon Locke uh, were three Americans and two Australians. We were the original co-founders. When we started to put it together, Hawaita was working on her master's degree, I think, and she said, contact me if you ever go. <laughs> I don't, she didn't believe we'd go either. Um, about a week before we went, uh, Mary called her and said, we need you. We really need you. We need you to be part of this. You're Palestinian, you're articulate. Uh, we need to have you come. And she did. So she became Free Gaza's spokesperson for uh, two or three years. She's articulate, um, she speaks Hebrew, she speaks Arabic, obviously, she speaks English, and she's young and she's attractive, and she was the spokesperson that we would send out uh, pretty much around the world. She's now, you do know, she's now pregnant. I, if you don't know who Huwaita is. She's pregnant, she's due in five weeks, and she's in the Israeli village where she comes from because she wants her son to be born and get Israeli citizenship, and the Israeli government just kicked Adam Shapiro, who's her husband, they just kicked him out yesterday. They said he couldn't stay, so she's staying anyhow. Okay? Yeah, well, I would expect that, you know. I mean, she wants to make sure the next generation <laughs> is going to be able to have the citizenship. Yeah. Let's talk about when the book was uh, released for publication uh, this past August uh, 23rd, the fourth anniversary of our arrival in Gaza. Uh, well, the day before, there were 11 negative reviews on Amazon. So we were curious. We, we decided to look at those reviews, and so we read them. And none of the people who did the reviews had read the book. It was obvious, because there was no reference to anything that we had in the book. But what there was was this woman is a Hamas sympathizer or a terrorist sympathizer and she hates Jews and what else did they say? They said all kinds of nasty stuff and this is a horrible book and you shouldn't read it. They don't want you to read this book. They don't want you to pay no attention to the man behind the curtain. You remember that from the Wizard of Oz? That's what they were saying. So, uh, you know, I was lower profile so nobody really attacked me. I was lucky that way, although I have had a, I've been called anti-Semitic for raising this issue in the past. Anybody who's tried has probably suffered that epitaph. Greta. Yeah. <laughs> I've been doing this for a really long time. People ask me all the time, why do you get involved in this? And I always say it's because somewhere along the line you meet a Palestinian and you start to listen to what the stories are, and you get pissed off. And I have been permanently pissed off now for almost 50 years because I married one, and my children are Palestinian, and he's a 1948 refugee, and he cannot go back to Safad, and even my children cannot go back to visit. My daughter got stamped on her passport for one week, even though she's an American, because she told the Israeli authorities that her father's name was Rebi. She could have said Richard, and they probably would have let her in. And she said, why should I have to do that? So I started because of my children and because of my outrage. I have stayed because I must. I, 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 I just have to. I'm, I come out of the 60s, like many of you in here have. What did we do? We worked for civil rights. We worked for women's rights. I worked for the rights of the South Africans. The least that I can do is work for the rights of my children and for so many people that I know. So I'm a bit outspoken. I'm sure you probably figured that out already. And of course, <laughs> they're going to come after me, and they have. Not only do they come after me as far as um, the book is concerned and, and, and yelling about my tweet that was sent out un, unbeknownst, unbeknownst to me. And it doesn't make any difference whether I was looking at a video or I was going to look at a video and I just saved it. How many of you in here on Facebook? Curious. Ooh, how many of you have made a posting mistake before? Oh, yes. <laughs> I sure did. <laughs> 
Boy, did I ever. I mean, you're on Facebook, and I've got 1,500 friends, and most of them are in the Palestine cause. And so you grab a video, or you grab an article, and you throw it onto your front page. Well, I thought I had grabbed it and thrown it into my little group. But I was on the road in Canada, and I didn't pay any attention to the settings. And you all know, if you're on Facebook, how fast they change the settings. What is that with change the settings? One moment it's private, the next moment it's public. And so I just grabbed it, threw it onto my, onto my front page and didn't pay any attention because I was getting on a train to get on a plane to fly back to California. And two days later, all hell broke loose because I found out, took two months by the way, I found out that uh, somebody had hacked into my Facebook account and, and connected the Free Gaza Twitter account to my Facebook account. But it took a computer expert almost two months to figure that out. And it's not worth it to go through it all again. Just, you know, I'm just saying, just drop it. It's just, it was so stupid to begin with. And I think that all of us feel that we have the right to watch a videotape. We have a right to read a book. We have a right to watch a movie. We have a right to do all of those. Unless, of course, we want to go back to the McCarthy era where my father was demonized because he was a union activist. And I'm not going to allow that to happen. And that's the particular story. In the meantime, of course, you know, and I, if you read the reviews, I sound like such a nasty person. Um, and I've been threatened. My children have been threatened. I had to hide my children in 1972 um, because I was the media contact for the Free Gaza. I would have people call me and say, we're going to sink the boat. Um, we're, uh, nobody is safe. I had, I had somebody call me and go, do you know how to swim? <laughs> I said, what? I said, do you know how to swim? I said, I don't understand you. You sound like you're underwater. <laughs> I thought it was funny. Um, so, you know, I, I, I tend to be flip. I tend to not take myself very seriously, but I definitely take what I do very seriously. I do want to say one thing. There's this lovely lady right in front. I know she's going to kill me. Her name is Mina. She's right there. She has been with the Free Gaza Movement since the moment it started. How many years? Five? Six? She was going to go with us on the first trip and she couldn't. And I, we were so sad that she couldn't come. And I think one of the things that we have found is this enormous network of people who wanted to do something and they didn't know what they wanted to do. They didn't know how they could do it. And I just wanted to point her out because she has been with Free Gaza forever, as long as we have, as long as Mary and I have. It's been six years. Well, I'll answer the first question quickly and then you can do the second. Is that good? Okay, so what, are, what is the future? I don't have a crystal ball, but as I see it, there's, there's four possibilities. And if you can find a fifth one, please tell me. The first possibility is the end of the world. I'm against that one. But Israel has three to 400 nuclear weapons. The US fleet has nuclear weapons in the Persian Gulf. We're worried India, Pakistan have nuclear weapons. We're worried Iran might get one nuclear weapon. So, you know, and, and people want pro they want, what is it, proactive preventative war? Didn't we hear this about Iraq, you know? Anyway, it's, I'm against that one. The second possibility was the two-state solution, and in 1993, I had guarded hope that that would happen, but what, my, as my friend Haidar al-Shafi, who's since deceased, he was on the Madrid delegation, he stopped going, and I asked him why. He lives in Gaza, he's a Gaza physician. He said, because I concluded they were negotiating in bad faith. So what has happened? We've had 20 years of, quote, peace process, uh, spelled P-I-E-C-E, -E, where they've chopped the West Bank into tiny pieces, and they've doubled the settlement population, and they've stopped any Palestinian building in East Jerusalem, and they've just built Israeli-only neighborhoods in East Jerusalem. So now there's half a million Israeli settlers in the West Bank, including East Jerusalem and Gaza is a concentration camp. So what kind of two-state solution is viable with that? So the third possibility is apartheid, and that's essentially what we have right now. Really, between the Mediterranean Sea and the Jordan River, there's one state in control. 
uh, the Palestinians have Bantu stands where they have limited autonomy, but they don't really have any control over their lives. So we can, if we have apartheid, we're going to have perpetual low-grade war or the end of the world or whatever. Um, the last possibility is where I think we have to go to get out of this mess, and that is liberty and justice for all. That is separation of religion and state. That is everybody who lives there, whether they're Jew, Muslim, Christian, Druze, agnostic, whatever, have equal rights. And if you can think of a fifth possibility, please tell me. I'll be in the back. I want to hear what, what it is. Can we have another option, Ramsey? You're Palestinian. You're from Gaza. Yeah, please. Ramsey, well, what do well, you think? Yeah, thank you for that. Uh, of course, I agree with, uh, with much of what you said. Uh, but I think we are looking at, uh, at two different scenarios here. One is that what is actually happening, uh, what is Israel uh, unilaterally imposing on Palestinians? I'm not sure if you heard that uh, as of uh, a few days ago, they introduced uh, segregated buses. In Jerusalem, I think it's a uh, uh, bus, uh, the 210 line that is uh, for Palestinians. And still, the settlers were not happy. They actually torched the bus a couple of days ago. Uh, so, so that is one track of what Israel has as far as the end game is concerned. Unfortunately, Israel has single-handedly de determined that end game, and they've had this design of theirs for many, many years. Uh, but uh, more specifically, in 1967 when they had uh, a specific plan on how to colonize the West Bank, how to drive the Palestinians out, how to use the land. Uh, and they had, uh, they had it all covered. Uh, the so-called international community was completely uh, oblivious to what's going on. Uh, and the US, if anybody dared cross a certain uh, limit, the US would come in with a veto or with uh, punishing this and censuring that and so forth and so on. So here's one, one scenario, and that is you know, the historical course that is happening and is being determined single-handedly by Israel. And here's the other possibility, and that's when we all come into this picture. Are we going to allow this to happen? Are we go going to let Israel make a determination on its own, exactly like the South African uh, apartheid government tried and failed, and numerous other authoritarian uh, and dictatorships have tried, and many of them have failed, are we going to uh, uh, let Israel make the de that determination, decide what to do with the Palestinians, deal with them as if they are subhumans to be uh, uh, pushed here and cornered there until they finally achieve their ultimate dream of having uh, a pure Jewish state over historic Palestine. Now, it's not, um, and, and I'm not uh, a wizard and I do not uh, read into the future, I'm just saying that this is what is in fact happening. Uh, we can talk about one state, two states, um, effectively. What is underway right now is a uh, 75 state solution that is whenever there is an Israeli military checkpoint in the West Bank dividing this village or this area, that is a state and these people are isolated in township or Bantu stands. So Israel is making that determination on its own. It's either we just simply acknowledge that and move on with our lives or acknowledge that and say, but no, we are not going to allow this to happen. Not in the 21st century, we are going to deal with segregated buses. This is history and has to remain within the confines of history. And that's where we as civil society come into the picture. So. That's what we're doing tonight. We're raising awareness. We're getting the word out. We're writing books. Uh, we're putting pressure on our senators and congressmen. Unfortunately, I've. I don't have a million dollars, you know, to, uh, you know, it is distressing that so much of our policy in this country is being dictated by wealthy lobbyists, but we have to fight that. And we've had small incremental successes. They tried to run Chuck Hagel out for Secretary of Defense and they failed. I'm hoping Obama will show some courage this term. And he's actually going to Israel and the West Bank shortly. And I, it'll be very interesting to see if anything positive comes of that. Uh, Basically, the question is about Christian Zionism and how it's playing out uh, into what is uh, going on in the Middle East. Is it uh, American policy in the Middle East? How much of it uh, is a factor? And, and 
Um, who's going to take this question, Bill? Sorry, I'll do this one because I come from OMAC, Washington, which is a small rural area, Washington State, and we don't really see the uh, Jewish Zionist influence there very much, but we do see Christian Zionist uh, influence in rural uh, America. But let me tell you, uh, there are Christians in Bethlehem that see the world quite differently from the Christian Zionists. And I think any religion, there's a full spectrum of ideology from liberation theology to uh, promoting the end times. People who want the end of the world to happen and are thinking that all the Jews have to go to the Holy Land and then there'll be a rapture and those that don't convert to Christianity will be condemned and the rest. Um, but again, Judaism, there's a whole spectrum of political thought and you can use biblical passages to justify whatever you want. Same thing with Islam. Uh, but I think we all have to turn to our humanity. So yes, Christian Zionism is a real influence in this country. Um, I won't speculate as to which is the bigger influence, whether it's Jewish Zionism or Christian Zionism or even agnostic Zionism. I'm sure there's a lot of Zionists that aren't really religious, don't you think? I wanted to add to this because I simply can't resist. Um, how many of you know who Gilad Otzman is? How many of you in here have read his book called The Wandering Who? I know you did because you, you didn't you write, Ramsey, didn't you write a review on it? A blurb. A, a blurb on it? Okay, well, one of the reasons I got myself into trouble is because I wrote a review of Gilad Otzman's book. I thought it was great. I don't have to agree with everything he has to say, I don't. But I said, after reading his journey, and being so stricken with so much of what he wrote, I thank God I was raised a Methodist. <laughs> so I got into trouble for that because I was being flip. But I meant that. I think that the Christian churches, such as the Methodist Church and the Presbyterian Church, need to stick to their guns and divest from Israel, yeah. period. Yeah, uh, up here on the screen, there's something that says, work with Gaza's Ark. And um, that's an initiative that's being done by many of the same people. We've gotten larger and larger. We, you know, we've got a Swedish group now. We've got um, a, a French group. Um, they've gone off. Many have gone off to do all kinds of different things. Um, I, I don't know if you remember the French group. They all got on board a plane and they all flew to Tel Aviv. Uh, none of those things would have happened had it not been for Free Gaza. What Free Gaza is working on right now is Gaza's Ark, and that's taking a boat out of Gaza and into Europe. And we encourage you to please go on their website, it's gazaark.org, look at what they're doing, buy some products. What we're going to try to do is load it with things like the embroidery that I have on, and then get contracts, especially in Europe, because Europe has an agreement with the Palestinians, and force Israel's hand. Thank you. Yeah, that's a good question. I think we have to separate between BDS as an idea, as a strategy, as a concept. Uh, yes, it's, it's boycott, uh, uh, divestments, and sanctions. Uh, we have to differentiate between it as an, a strategy and between uh, the political dimension of uh, BDS, which involves individuals uh, who might uh, correctly or otherwise interpret the ideas uh, behind BDS. Uh, and I think um, BDS um, has uh, or is often is being criticized uh, for things that might have been the, uh, uh, a misjudgment on the behalf of, of uh, an individual or a group, but that by no means should uh, uh, taint the strategy itself. It's very important strategy. Um, and, and I'll tell you why. Um, for many years, we kind of been caught in this, in this situation where we are just standing in the middle, uh, uh, incapable of doing anything. We get together and we talk about how terrible the situation is. It's what I, you know, like uh, crying over the ruins type of thing. Uh, it's, it's just as of recently, we actually get, caught, uh, get uh, together to talk about strategies, actions, Gaza arc, that sort of thing. Finally, our societies, our communities 
are now on the uh, offensive. They are coming up with ideas, they are strategizing, and, and, and they are leading a movement, a collective movement, towards actually doing something. Remember that question, and, and many of you, I'm sure, can relate to it, of what can be done? We can't do anything. That's the question I I've, I've came to Seattle 20 years ago. I disappeared back a few years back, and I just came back, and lots of people were still asking the question, what can we do? Well, guess what? Now we have a, a whole set of options of what we can do. Of course, it doesn't guarantee results because that's the nature of, of this conflict. What we need to do is to get involved as communities, using whatever strategies that may work or may not work. Um, I think we, um, the, the issues that Greta addressed earlier about the email and, and all of that, I think it's important that we also realize that we are going to differ on lots of issues. But at the end of the day, it's essential that we remain united. And I'm not, I'm not saying this in a sentimental or a poetic way. Uh, we need every individual, we need every effort, we need the academic as much as we need the person in the street, we need, we need um, everyone to be part of this and that was the brilliance of the, uh, of the Free Gaza movement because it included all of them. For the first time there was no polarization, the Jews and the Arabs and the, the, the Christian Zionists and, and all of that and we are very cautiously moving uh, into like uh, trying to find middle grounds and then we balk and go, move back, that is over. We are trying to build a universal global movement and that's where BDS comes in, that's what BDS allows us to do. Are we going to agree or disagree on some issues? Yes, we will. Are we going to agree or disagree on how we interpret some of the diktats or some of the strategies of BDS? Yes, we will. But it is out of that agreement and disagreement the movement will be propelled forward. It's important that we don't get distracted, we do not get sidetracked, and we carry on with our mission despite of all of our differences. Please say the three BDS goals. Yes. Okay, the three that's... things that BDS does. <laughs> Well, ending the occupation. Ending the occupation. Uh, ending the occupation, yes. That's no. equal rights. Equal rights for Palestinians right living inside, inside Israel Palestinians and the right of return for Palestinian refugees and Israel. And number three, the right of return for Palestinian refugees per uh, UN Resolution 194. Ending the occupation, equality for Palestinians and Israelis living in Israel and the right of return for Palestinian refugees. Yeah. Thank you all for coming tonight. Now, there are handouts about Gaza's Ark in the back. These are free. If you haven't bought the book yet, please buy it. All royalties, well, the bulk of the royalties are going to Gaza Community Mental Health Program and other Gaza-related projects. Greta and I are not profiting in any way from this book nor are our 25 co-authors. How the hell are you going to divide that 25 ways anyway? So it is going to help the people of Gaza. Please buy our book, and thank you for coming thank tonight. Thank you. Thank you, all of you.